begin our webinar today with a land acknowledgement of the land that I sit on here in Montana. I acknowledge that many indigenous peoples, including the Crow, Nez Pierce, Lakota, Blackfeet, Salish, Shoshone, and Northern Cheyenne have traditional claims to the lands upon which I physically sit here in Montana. Indigenous histories and perspectives can teach us a reciprocal relationship with the earth. I invite you to drop into the chat the land acknowledgement for your area. Uh, my name is Sarah Paulos. I am the program manager for Interfaith Power and Light National. And I just want to welcome everybody to today's IPL webinar called Sacred Ground, A Message of Hope. We'll talk about the film, Kiss the Ground, and what congregations can do to be part of the solution. So if you've just joined the webinar, welcome. As you join, introduce yourself to all panelists and attendees by dropping your name and congregational or state affiliate uh, in the chat box so we can all see who's here. So welcome to today's webinar, Sacred Ground, A Message of Hope. We'll talk about the film Kiss the Ground and what congregations can do to be part of the solution. Feel free to interact with one another in the chat box and put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to a few of your questions, time permitting, at the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and also streamed live on Facebook, and then you'll get a link via email after the event to the recording. Faith Climate Action Week's theme, IPL's Faith Climate Action Week, our theme this year is sacred ground, cultivating connections between food, faith, and climate. And we examine how our food systems contribute to injustice and to climate change and how our faiths call us to respond through practical solutions. Food injustice, climate injustice, and racial injustice are all intertwining threats with particular impact on black, indigenous, people of color, and low-income communities. We can address all of these challenges with our growing practices. IPL's Faith Climate Action Week's featured film this year is Kiss the Ground, a fabulous new film about how regenerating the world's soils has the potential to rapidly stabilize Earth's climate, restore lost ecosystems, and create abundant food supplies. We've had a fantastic sign-up of over 3,000 people, with many screening it to groups of 100 people or more. And the feedback so far has been that people are loving it. So we are really pleased to have with us today the filmmaker, Josh Tickle, and also IPL's own Veronica Kyle, statewide outreach director of our IPL affiliate in Illinois called Faith in Place, and our special guest, Pastor Rashorna Fitzpatrick, to tell us about her congregation's interfaith garden, Stone Temple Peace Garden. IPL president, Reverend Susan Hendershot, will be conducting the conversation. Thank you. Susan, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I also wanna extend my welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. And as we begin, I want to share this quote from this year's Faith Climate Action Week Sacred Ground Guide. The quote is, food is an important part of our faith traditions. We use it to express our connection to each other to the earth and to our spirituality. Our traditions have certain beliefs about food. We use food symbolically in our liturgies and various faith traditions require specific food practices in the daily lives of their believers. And all the major faith traditions call us to care for the earth. So how we grow our food is integral to the way we care for the earth and each other as religious people. And this is why we have chosen the theme of Sacred Ground and the film Kiss the Ground for this year's Faith Climate Action Week theme. So an overview of our time together today. First, we're going to talk a little bit with filmmaker Josh Tickle about the film Kiss the Ground and the power of regeneration to solve the climate crisis. Then Veronica Kyle of Faith in Place, our Illinois Interfaith Power and Light affiliate, will share a story of Faith in Place's sustainable agriculture work. Then Pastor Rashorna Fitzpatrick will share about her work with the Stone Temple Peace Garden. 
And finally, as time permits, we will have a Q&A session and opportunity for you to ask questions of our panelists today. So I wanna start out by introducing our filmmaker, Josh Tickle. Josh is an internationally recognized author, film director, speaker, and expert on sustainability and the climate. Josh has been a featured guest on Jay Leno's The Tonight Show and Good Morning America. He is a regularly featured opinion leader in news stories on CNN, Discovery, Reuters, NBC, Fox, and NPR. His first feature film, Fuel, won the Sundance Audience Award for the Best Documentary, and it was shortlisted for an Oscar and was screened in the White House. Producing and directing with his wife, Rebecca Harrell Tickle, he followed the movie up with the critically acclaimed award-winning energy-related films, The Big Fix and Pump, and now Kiss the Ground. The movie released globally on Netflix to rave, rave reviews by both the New York Times and Los Angeles Times and earned a 100% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. That is pretty impressive, Josh, I have to say. I don't think I've seen 100% on Rotten Tomatoes before. Kiss the Ground has been met with great enthusiasm by the Interfaith Power and Light Network of 20,000 congregations. And we are so excited to have you here with us, Josh. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's, it's a tremendous honor to be here. It's a tremendous honor to meet all of you. So thanks for having me. Well, and I, I have a few questions for us to get started today. And first, as we begin this conversation, I wondered if you could just tell us about your personal experience with environmental health issues and how that has inspired your career in environmental filmmaking. Yeah, sure. I grew up in an unusual part of the country uh, in southern Louisiana in an area that's commonly called the Cancer Corridor, Cancer Alley. It's uh, 150 petrochemical facilities that stretch the highway between Baton Rouge and Houston. The average incidence of cancer is 800 times the national average. So, you know, lymphoma, leukemia, these are types of things that were just endemic in the area that I grew up in. Um, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out, hey, look, here's a big chemical facility, a bunch of people living next to it, we can smell it, it's in our eyes, it stings our skin, uh, maybe this is what's making everybody sick. And so from a very young age, I became interested in science, uh, specifically science around solutions. Uh, what can we do differently? How can we find different pathways to live well on Earth, but also live well with each other and the planet? Um, and, and that, you know, that's pulled me into activism. It's pulled me into journalism. And I guess when I got together with my wife, Rebecca, we started directing these films together. And so now we, as a couple, co-direct these movies. She directed Kiss the Ground with me. Um, and, you know, Kiss the Ground was the beginning of a conversation about regeneration. It is, it's kind of like the introduction chapter in a book in a way. Uh, there is so much more to tell, so much more that we are learning, and we're making two other films on the subject at the, at the present time. So uh, we have been humbled by how much we didn't know, even after the first film. Um, and it, it just continues to really uh, open up this conversation of how do we have a global agriculture system that regenerates the ecosystems, but also takes care of people in a way of plenty and abundance and doesn't pit us against each other, that can actually create more equanimity, that can create more equitable food systems for more people. And I think as we begin to delve into the next movie, uh, we're seeing things that we could have never even imagined in the first film in terms of the problem and the solution. That's fantastic. And, and I'm curious to know why you chose filmmaking as your medium for, for telling these stories. Uh, well, in response to sort of growing up in the cancer corridor of the oil petroleum industry, I drove a van in 1997 called the Veggie Van across the country. Um, I was, you know, young in my early 20s and 
it was just a brightly painted van that was powered by used French fry grease. And it, it was just a, it was a story. It was a, it was a new statement to say, hey, look, maybe there's a different way that we can do these things called, you know, making fuel and energy. Um, and I did presentations, little PowerPoints, you know, for 10 or 20 people. At some stage on that journey, I realized I'm gonna have to do a lot of 10 to 20 person PowerPoints to get this story across. Uh, and a friend of mine handed me a video camera. He said, look, just film everything that happens and you'll figure it out later. Well, it's later. It's 20, 23, 24 years later. Uh, and I think we're still trying to figure it out. But at the very least, I think, uh, and I speak for Rebecca as well as myself, we've centered on filmmaking as a way to um, not just tell our personal story, but hopefully tell larger stories that want to be told. Mm, that's that's so inspiring. I love it. Yeah, that's a lot of PowerPoints to be sure. And and I'm I'm curious because you know the word regeneration has significance in many religious traditions, as you know. So it, it means spiritual renewal or revival, and it can also mean rebirth or resurrection, which of course, for some of our spiritual traditions is very, very central. So what does regeneration mean in terms of agriculture? Mm. Well, I mean, it's a great point. Here we are just past Easter, uh, we're having a conversation of, you know, regeneration, resurrection. When we began to look at regeneration inside the Kiss the Ground investigation in terms of agriculture, but where we've ended and where we're going into the, the next project is in terms of regeneration as a concept. And when we think about nature, uh, we think about regeneration all the time, but we don't realize that's what we're thinking about. You know, when you pick a leaf off a tree, the tree regrows the leaf doesn't have to think about it. It's just part of, it's just part of its, you know, it's part of its beingness of a tree. Uh, the same with a lizard. If a lizard loses its tail, it regrows its tail. And because as humans, we tend to spend a lot of time in our local place, we don't generally pull back. And technology has allowed us to pull back and look at entire ecosystems. And now what we realize is when you degrade and denude and destroy an ecosystem, that ecosystem with a little bit of human love and energy can be completely regenerated. And we're talking vast tracts, deserts, huge portions of the planet. And so we've degraded two thirds of the planet's land now. Two thirds of the planet's topsoil is gone, essentially. Uh, and the UN predicts that we'll degrade the other one third of the planet's topsoil within 50 years. So it took us 10,000 years to do two thirds of degradation. It's only gonna take us because we're a global population moving very fast now, 50 years to do the other third. And that's a warning call. That's a real moment of, um, it's, a, it's a call for help from the planet. It's a call for, for help from our global civilization. And I think it's up to those of us who are engaged in this conversation to bring that out of a place of fear to a place of consciousness and connection. Regeneration does mean rebirth. And to understand that this great creation that we live on has the innate intelligence to rebirth itself, but we have to participate. We have to be a willing participant. We can't be a, a destroyer in that. We have to be a co-creator um, and, and honor the creation that we're part of. That's a, that's a big shift for industrial society because we've been taught for a couple hundred years that we need to, uh, you know, man versus nature. You know, we've got to subjugate nature and make nature in man's image. Uh, and I don't think if we look at a lot of the sacred texts of our world, I don't think that's consistent with the teachings of our great spiritual teachers. So I think it's a real opportunity uh, for spirituality, human consciousness, and science to come together to say, well, great, we're gonna have 10 billion souls living on this big blue you know, marble hurling through space. What do we wanna do? Do we wanna approach the next 50 years to safeguard the next 10,000 years with humility, consciousness, spirituality, love, and science? Or do we just wanna just plow it all up and see what happens? So 
I, I hope we're going to go with the former option. And I think that's, you know, why, uh, why I'm participating in this work. So beautifully said. Thank you so much, Josh. That was really lovely. And thinking about how our spiritual traditions can contribute to the healing and the interconnectedness of our world. And certainly we know that historically they uh, sometimes have done just the opposite. You know, they've really contributed um, to the desecration of the world. And we sort of have used uh, religious language as a as a way to justify that and um, so it's so lovely to hear you uh, thinking about the intersection and the spiritual component of this um, and and soil health is um, is obviously so interconnected with human health and I wonder if you can say a word to us about that especially what you've learned as you've been uh, you know both doing this project the kiss the ground film and you know the the new projects that you're working on well uh, one of the one of the people who appears in kiss the ground Ray Archuleta who's uh, he's part Native American he says we're soil on legs because if you really study the bacteria in our gut, which has a tremendous influence over our decisions of what we eat and how we utilize our body, that bacteria is the same in many respects as the bacteria in the soil. You see young kids, you know, babies, they'll eat soil. Uh, and, and there's a theory that they're, they're customizing their gut flora to the local ecosystem. So we're very, very connected with soil what we are learning as we study soil is that if the soil doesn't have microbial life in it, your food doesn't have nutrition in it. So there's this growing understanding that we can't just grow food in sand, which is what a lot of the dirt in the United States has become. It's mostly just silica. And so we're putting chemicals into the silica, into the dirt to make the food look good and to produce a quantity per acre, but the quantity of nutrition has gone straight down. In most cases, it's reduced between 60 to 90% of what it was at, at the end of the World War II. So we've substituted look and quantity for real nutritional value. And I, I think that has a lot to do with, it says a lot about our society, about our our, our selves as beings, you know, we've, we've gone to a very, you know, visual society versus what's in our heart, who are we really, uh, what are the important things, and, and I think if you look at, you know, certainly biblical references, we're, we're talking about Genesis, we're talking about the creation of life, um, and, and we're talking about, you know, being cre caretakers of the creation. And so in some respects, modern agriculture has done wonderful things, but it's forgotten the central tenet, which is if you don't take care of the creation, the creation can't take care of you. And, and so in many ways, this is going back to the basics. It's not saying we have to live in grass huts and you know, dirt floors, but it is saying, okay, great. We've got all the science and technology. We still have to take care of the life in the soil, because that's the life that puts the nutrition in the food. So it can't just be a profit-driven, bigger, better, faster, cheaper kind of mentality. And unfortunately, if you look at what that mentality has brought, specifically in the United States since World War II, our poverty numbers have increased radically since the birth of industrial agriculture. We've taken away small family holdings and small family farms and small family grocery stores and we've taken away that connection to nutrition. And as a result, we're eating bulk foods that look good, but don't, they don't nourish us. So a lot of the work that we're doing now in the second film is about the connection between nourishment and soil and community and how these things can fit back together, even if we got off track for a little while. Mm -hmm. That's 
that's lovely. Uh, the sense of community is so, so important. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned to you a while ago, I, I lived in Iowa for 26 years. It's where I raised both of my sons and uh, lived in some small rural communities as well as in the capital city of Des Moines. And um, have known many farmers over over that time, uh, and even in some of the small communities uh, where I lived. And um, I was so inspired in the film to see uh, so many farmers who were making the shift. And of course, you tell the story of one in particular, uh, con you know, conventional farmer who had gone through some some cycles of, of drought and flooding and you know made the decision um, sort of was forced to make the decision to to change his way of farming um, and and really the beauty that is on that farm and the diversity uh, that is on that farm and now how he's going out and inspiring other farmers and um, I just you know I want to just ask you um, what you know, why, why is regenerative agriculture such an important solution to the climate crisis? Mm. That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The simple answer is when it's done at scale, regenerative agriculture builds soil, not just topsoil, but subsoil. And the microbes in the soil are what essentially pull carbon dioxide down into the subsoil. So about 40% plus or minus of the carbon that a plant takes in, if it's properly working with the soil, will be conveyed down, 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 deep into the substrate layers. It can stay there for thousands of years. So we look at the climate, we look at carbon dioxide. We say, well, the humankind has emitted about a thousand gigatons, about a thousand billion tons of carbon dioxide since the birth of the Industrial Revolution. We have to put that somewhere because it is affecting weather patterns. So we can't put more in the atmosphere, that's full. Can't put more in the oceans. The oceans have absorbed as many CO, you know, CO2 molecules as they can and it turns into carbonic acid there. That leaves us with only one option. It's gotta go into the ground. And luckily, this great creation that we live on has a self-balancing mechanism, microbes. And if we incentivize those microbes with plants without tilling the soil, with taking care of that topsoil, we can absorb exactly a thousand billion gigatons. We can absorb the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere to begin with. So that's just, you know, when you think on these levels uh, of, of, you know, trillions of microbes and billions of CO2 tons, it is clear that there is a greater force at play, right? Humanity, we always put ourselves in the driver's seat and then we realize, well, maybe we shouldn't do all the driving. Maybe we should let, you know, some of these big forces, and you can call it um, nature, you can call it, you know, the force, but in some way, shape or form, many of our religions call it God. So there is this power that runs through these natural systems. Can we learn to use the power correctly? Can we learn to use it to rebuild soil? It turns out when you rebuild soil, you balance the ecosystem, you balance the climate, and you create fresh water because soil absorbs water. So you begin to replenish rivers, water supplies, wells, aquifers. There's this entire effect that is system-wide and human-wide. And just noticing a couple of questions, you know, what is Secretary Vilsack think? Secretary Vilsack actually watched the Kiss the Ground movie and he said, regeneration is the way forward. So we know that when people see this, it is a climate solution but the solution also provides two to five to sometimes 10 times more calories per acre because the density of food production goes up because the soil can support more food. So now we have a climate solution, but we also have a poverty solution. And this is an empowering way to deal with these problems. So I, I, I'm so excited to have this conversation. You know. Um, Sarah has access to the Kiss the Ground DVD. We, we have been providing DVDs to Interfaith Power and Light so that as many congregations can get the movie as possible. There's a shorter cut uh, called The Farmer Cut that's available. It's on that DVD as well as online. And there's a shorter cut called Kiss the Ground for Schools, which is free online. And anyone can download that Kiss the Ground movie. 
Uh, and those have some new sequences in it with some some great Native American contributors and um, just just we want this uh, information to be in everybody's hands. That's great, Josh. And we're, we're going to come back to you with some questions uh, towards the end of our conversation, but I'm going to shift us over um, because we know that congregations have long been involved in distributing food to relieve hunger uh, and to shore up those who are in poverty. And many have engaged on the growing end as well. And IPL's affiliate in Illinois, Faith in Place, has supported congregational growing efforts for nearly 20 years. Veronica Kyle, statewide outreach director of Faith in Place, has some inspiring stories to share with us. And so I want to introduce Veronica. Veronica Kyle is the statewide outreach director of Faith in Place, IPL's Illinois affiliate. And she has a particular passion for programs related to sustainable food and land use and community outreach and has been instrumental in supporting many outstanding congregational supported agriculture projects in and around Chicago. In her work, she seeks to bring people to the table that are often not involved in conversations around earth care, including African-American, Latino, and affluent suburban communities. She has done this work by creating award-winning programs that bring about diversity and cross-cultural community engagement. Veronica's work has been nationally recognized as the 2013 Audubon Toyota Green Fellow and a 2014 North America Association of Environmental Educators Fellow. She is currently serving a sixth term as an appointed environmental justice commissioner for the state of Illinois. So Veronica, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and welcome. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Josh. That was awesome presentation. Um, I'm hoping we can get that out to many of our green team houses of worship. Um, I am delighted to be here, Susan. I am very excited to talk about our work. So, you know, fire away. I don't All know right. <laughs> well, let's let's dig in. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump right in with a question for you, and that is that. Food injustice, climate injustice, and racial injustice are all intertwining threats with particular impact on Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led and low-income communities. Can you unpack these intersecting challenges for us? Wow. And how many hours do I have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, they all the dots connect. This is unfortunately a tapestry of systemic racism very much played out in our country on so many levels. It's very hard to separate any injustice from another. So a social injustice is an economic one, it's an environmental one, it's a health one, it's a racial one, very often even a gender related one, right? And until we broaden that lens and understand that, we will stay here around the issue of climate injustice because those who are most affected by climate change are usually the least contributors to the damage, right? And this too is by design. Um, very often people in various communities, I surely grew up and was born in Anniston, Alabama, Monsanto cesspool. 90% um, of the elders who passed away, some prematurely in my family had some type of upper up respiratory cancer or lung disease. From there, we migrated to Argyle Gardens in Chicago, the far east side of the city, right before you move into the suburbs. And that was considered and still is the toxic donut. There is the landfill, there's the docks, and there's the steel mill. Interesting enough, backed up to a beautiful forest preserve that when I was growing up was not a safe place for people of color to go to. So this, this idea of climate injustice and food insecurity, all connected to systemic racism. And very often in those communities that we talk, I actually live on the Southeast side in a community called South Shore, which at one point before white flight, the integration of this community were black celebrities, Muhammad Ali, Gail Sayers, you know, 
uh, Dick Gregory and beyond. And as more and more Blacks move to South Shore, I'm a four minute walk from the lake. Three beaches I can get to all within about 10 or 15 minutes. The disinvestment in the commercial quarters. Recently, it's taken us six years to get a grocery store. And when we were, you know, kind of courted as a community organizers, so some of our mainline stores that are in more affluent communities, they told us our community didn't fit the profile for them to come and invest. So fortunately, um, a woman investor and her family decided to uh, take a chance on our community. And thus we have a local market, which is a beautiful grocery store, but here's an opportunity that was lost. So for six years, if you did not have the transportation or the money to even take the bus to the, the closest grocery store, where were you gonna get fresh food and produce? And even with the corner stores, how long has the banana and the apple been sitting there, right? And very often when you go in, if you have people who have businesses in your community that don't necessarily respect you and your humanity, you might go in and smell that people smoke. People don't wash their hands when they handle your food. So many of us, we're not going to shop in that store. I'm fortunate. I can get in a car. I can call an Uber. I can go. But for some people, that kind of ended the opportunity to have what we would call access to healthy food. I think the other thing, and Josh talked about it, the greed, capitalistic greed has got us here. Large scale agriculture, you know, pesticides, herbicides. These are the ways in which we grow food for the masses and we like to grow it cheap, right? Cheap food and a lot of it quickly. Um, but it's interesting too, you know, this is a time for us to re-educate ourselves. And one of the things that we've been doing at Faith in Place through our conversations around racial healing is reminding that African-American people and many people of color, the whole idea of regenerative agriculture, it's nothing new. Dr. George Washington Carver, you know, who was born a slave and ultimately became the professor at Tuskegee. I mean, he was doing this hundreds of years ago and teaching it, right? And then you have Booker T. Watley, not Booker T. Washington, he's great too, who was creating CSAs, he called them clientele membership clubs where this fresh food was given and it was reducing um, the, the cost for people to have access to food. So I also want to say this is at a time where um, our brothers from another mother need to listen to the women because we've been talking about this for a long time. And so books like Farming While Black by Leah Penniman, history, talks about the sacredness coming all the way from Africa, from the continent. You know, I tell people when they talk about the slave trade and I tell young kids, people don't steal trash, they steal treasure. So to bring Africans over, they agriculturally, we already knew what to do. All right, somebody put Leah Penniman's book, So Fire Farm, yes, and her book, Farming While Black, it's, I, this should be on every table of anybody who cares about this. And then you have Diane Glaze, To Love the Wind in the Rain, African Americans and Environmental History. And you get all of this. And that's Diane Glaze, G-L-A-V-E. To Love the Wind and the Rain. Caroline Finney, Black Faces in White Spaces. Once we read these books, we realize that very much what Josh has talked about was already happening. But with greed, discrimination of black farmers, right? We just learned of the $6 billion settlement. Black farmers have been fighting for for 40 years. And can you imagine how many of our indigenous native uh, brothers and sisters feel? Because quite frankly, we're all talking about stolen land that was taken from them. So Josh talked about this whole idea of, um, and I love the quote you said, you know, man conquering nature. Right? But if we look at nature as a woman, it's like man conquering a woman. It's a, this is a gender issue because what does the soil produce? What does nature produce? Life. What do women produce? Life. 
very few male species in nature can hold a baby and deliver their young. So when I think about what we've done to the earth, just imagine we've done this to our mother, our life-giving source, the soul. We have dumped and poisoned her and polluted her and abused her. And if she really, if the earth really reared its head like a female in the flesh, how horrible this would be. There would be a cry out. How dare a man treat a woman like this? So, you know, from my eco womanist lens, this is how I look at it, Susan. It's that's beautiful, Veronica. And thank you. Um, it's such a beautiful reminder of the way that life is generated, as you as you remarked on. And um, and that soil, of course, is is life and is also a part of us. And I know you have a special guest for us today as well, that someone that you want to introduce uh, and who is going to tell us a story about one particular garden program in Chicago, in the Chicago area. And so I want to invite you to introduce Pastor Rashorna to us. I will, thank you. And before we, we hear from Pastor Roshona, we have a short video of Pastor Roshona's um, uh, collaborative vision with a Jewish synagogue, Chicago Sinai. These are two of our green team congregations. And that's another thing. We have got to reach across the line, stop being afraid to work together. I wanna say to every 450 people on this, go find you somewhere else in the other community to get your hands in the soil and support what is happening so we can stop being afraid to go and help one another. And so I'd love for you to watch this short video and it'll tell a beautiful story. I'm so proud of this story because our motto at Faith in Place is to educate connect and to advocate. You know that, Susan. And this was a perfect example of what happens when we do that as people of faith and when we trust one another and build relationships. So if you could show that. And the next voice you will hear after this will be the Pastor Roshana visionary. Uh, I'm so proud of Pastor Roshana. So we'll go with this. Hello, I'm Samantha Miller, Faith in Places Energy and Climate Change Support. I'm also the Green Team Coach for the historic Stone Temple Baptist Church. Stone Temple sought to create an urban garden as a safe haven of peace for the community with fresh produce. Faith in Place connected Stone Temple with Chicago Sinai Congregation, two very different green teams from opposite sides of Chicago. These two teams garden together, but also share their faith, heritage, and cultures as well. The Peace Garden lit the way for more positive changes, including a performance stage and a future meditation garden and social enterprise to employ young people. Pastor Rashana Fitzpatrick often says, all things work together when you have faith in place. Let's hear more from Pastor Roshana and Susan Stone now. What the Stone Temple Green Team with the Chicago Sinai Green Team have been able to accomplish since the beginning is just been some amazing things in the North Lawndale community. Our congregation in partnership with Stone Temple Church has um, accomplished a number of things during the past almost two years. The first thing we were able to accomplish was through our meetings with both of the groups from Stone Temple and from Chicago Sinai was just developing a relationship, first of all, and then the empowerment that we were able to bring forth um, just out of the meetings that we had. Underlying each of the uh, specific successful projects has been a wish and a commitment to develop relationships, uh, relationships of, of collaboration and trust where we could learn from one another. So from there, we um, decided that we were gonna go out on a lot and see how we were going to put our heads together, our ideas together, our plan together, and create a, a beautiful garden. That garden, um, where it is now, started out as just a vacant lot. 
and it was a thoroughfare for all types of negative activity and um, just a lot of rubbish was there. So we came together and decided that we were gonna do something phenomenal and we have done that. The community is safer. There is a lot of fun that takes place on that garden, in that garden space. Um, there's been a baby shower there. There's been a birthday parties. We had a ribbon cutting ceremony. So there's lots of celebratory things that are happening in that vacant lot that is now a beautiful garden and it's just because stone temple and chicago sinai thanks to the help of faith in place develop a partnership that is spilling over into the community that's bringing love and peace and unity and i'm so happy to be a part of this organization what we're looking forward to is when we can be together again and to use the beautiful new stage that uh, the Pastor Roshona also got built to have presentations to tell each of our faith communities history and heritage and to, to forge relationships and bring our faith communities closer together. So I'm so excited about the stage because it will allow us to tell our stories, to give our narratives. Oftentimes our stories and our narratives are given by people who are not even from our communities and who really don't know our truths. So the Chicago Sinai family, the North Landale family, the Stone Temple family will be able to go on stage, tell our own stories, give our own narratives from a historical standpoint of what we know and what we've experienced. So I am super excited about what people will be able to hear that we have to say because we've lived it. I, I swear by faith in place because you guys, or now we, just do some awesome and amazing work. And when we come together, it's just things happen, beautiful things happen. I, I never did a garden before. And when I look at it, I'm amazed at what what's out there. I really am. It, and it's because faith in place said you can do it. And I believed it and we did it. In Judaism, we have a tradition uh, that we call tikkun olam, which means the repair of the world. It energizes our commitment to lighting the way through work for social justice. Uh, in Stone Temple uh, Church, we have found a partner who is also deeply committed to making its community healthier, safer, and more connected. When we can be together again in person, our handsome new stage will allow us to tell all of our stories and light the way through establishing more loving connections. The Historical Stone Temple Church lights the way by bringing unity into the community. Pastor Roshana, take it away, it's you. So hello everyone. Whenever I see this video or hear about um, what has been accomplished through Stone Temple Faith in Place in Chicago Sinai um, Congregation, I get a little emotional because it's such a beautiful experience. We have um, been together for the last three years and I always say this about Faith in Place. When Faith in Place brings partners to the table, they bring partners with everything that you can ever imagine needing. Um, I had never gardened before. I had never planted anything. I was one of the children in the school. When you plant the seed in the styrofoam cup, it never grew. But um, thanks to Faith in Place with our partners, Everything that we plant in that garden, it grows beautifully. The soil is great. We have beautiful partners, the community. One thing that has really blessed me about this whole partnership, and I say partnership is because we're partners and everybody brings something to the ship. I mean, we all bring our love. We bring our hands to work. We bring our gloves to work with. We bring whatever it is that it, it takes to make sure that we are doing a great job for our community. Now, in partnering with Chicago Sinai, I just can't say that they are my partners. They're actually my friends and my family. We bring our kids out. We come together and we actually have a true fellowship. We have actually 
gone to each other's, um, well, they come to the church and we've gone to the synagogue to give sermons. And that is what a true relationship is when you invite me to your home, because your place of worship is your home. And that is the type of relationship that we have in our community. People are coming. Now we're developing more farmers in our community because of this one vacant lot that has been transformed into an amazing space for peace, for love, for growth. And you can actually sit down and grab a peach very soon or a plum off or a peach off of a tree because we planted trees that will produce fruit. So that is what I'm so excited about here today. Being able to have a space created in your community that never existed before, seeing that space being a place of peace, it's really a peace garden. People come and they meditate, they sit there, they've had all types of family and, and opportunities where, where they never could have done it before because of the way that space looked. Faith in place brought in the right partners. One of the things that was amazing was how the plans went. Everything that we planned in those planning meetings is actually in that garden, is visible, it manifested. And it didn't cost a lot of money, but it was work. And people have to be willing to work. And another thing it, it cost us was building and developing relationships with people in the community. We got so much community buy-in. We got the adults in the community who live in the buildings that are adjacent to the garden. They come into the garden and they work and they sit there. And guess what? They get a chance to take home collard greens. They get a chance to take home mustard greens. They get a chance to take home green tomatoes. And I can smell the fried green tomatoes coming through the windows. And it makes me so excited because here's a community where in 1950s, the better part of 1950s and the early 60s, Dr. King came and he spoke there. And he spoke there on many occasions and he spoke about equality and he spoke about housing and he spoke about fair everything. So what are we thinking about today? We have to use our thought process to look at our environment. We have to be fair to our environment. We have to be fair to one another. We have to make sure that everybody gets their fair share. And how do we do that? By building partnerships, by coming together, by having some conversations that may be hard conversations, but you gotta have them, right? And you gotta build those relationships and you gotta share and you gotta talk and you gotta speak and you gotta speak your truths. You gotta tell your narratives. You gotta partner with people who really want to partner. When you take care of the environment, you take care of each other, everybody gets their fair share, then all of what we are experiencing begins to diminish. And then we have this regeneration as Joshua was talking about, this new birth in relationships, in foods, in gardens, in communities. And that's really what we're looking for is to build and you build with people, you build with ideas, you build with time and you build with understanding. And so I'm so happy to be here today. I'm happy with the fact that we have this opportunity to now grow our community with fresh food. We're a food desert and we're, we're overcoming that because about 25 community members are asking me, can you help us start gardens? Me? And I said, absolutely yes, because I have a team, I have partners, I have people who are willing to do it. And they don't just come with conversation, they come with resources, they come with information, they come to empower, to educate, they come to build. And I'm super excited about it. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here just to share because it's such a good feeling to be able to share and tell people, look at where we are. Look at where we've come from, but look at where we're going and we are going somewhere. And I'm happy to say that I'm happy about where we're going. Veronica, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for having me, um, Reverend Susan. This has been amazing. Josh, I'm going to get a chance to look at your, your video as well. Wow, it's so beautiful. What a wonderful story. And I, I'm so inspired that it's called a peace garden and mm -hmm. and it started with building relationships because of mm -hmm. course that is how we build peace amongst ourselves as well. So uh, it is it is just a, a beautiful example. And then the way that that is spreading, um, the others that you have inspired uh, within the community to take on a similar project. And, and as you said, in an area that is a food desert and where people need access to fresh, healthy food, 
um, it, it's it's such a beautiful um, beautiful example and just a beautiful model for um, I'm sure everyone who is who mm -hmm. is on this webinar today. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited now because um, well, first of all, let me say if you haven't yet seen the film Kiss the Ground, you can still view it through IPL through April 26. And when you register, you get the link to uh, view the feature film as well as the two 45 minute versions that Josh mm -hmm. had referenced earlier. So please do that if you haven't yet. And I know Sarah is dropping some information into the chat uh, for everyone to access that as well. But now we have some time for some Q&A, which is always fun. And um, Sarah is going to jump in here with us and um, share some questions. And I think also share if they're for a particular uh, person, a panelist, or uh, just for, for all of you. So uh, Sarah, I will let you jump in. Great, there are so, so many questions. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm just going to start with one for Veronica first. For so many people on our list are leaders in their congregation. And this is from Ruth. She says, I would love to hear from Veronica for ideas on how our congregations can get involved in our local communities that are food deserts and enhance their access to healthy and local grown food. So Veronica, take it away. Thanks. Um, great question. Um, go to those communities. Um, reach out to clergy leaders in those communities or the block club leader or who's running the, the, the pastor Roshanas who's over the, the garden and say, hey, I wanna help. It's that simple. See what systemic racism has done, it has made us afraid of the other. Mm -hmm. And they have this, uh, the great Audre Lorde poet Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So our new tool must be courage to build relationships. Mm -hmm. See, it's intentional. That's what systemic racism did. It, it intentionally brought us, uh, made sure we were separate. I can't imagine anybody rolling up on the west side at Pastor Roshona's garden or Tony, uh, um, Tony Williamson who has Mother Carr's farm in Linwood, African-American who has a farm or any of uh, Pembroke, the blueberry farm that Faith in Place also helps with a CSA, you roll up in there, red, black, blue, green, and yellow and say, hey, I came to help. They're gonna say, come on, let's do this thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the wonderful thing because what we all have in common is we need to eat healthier. Josh talked about that. We need clean water and we need clean air. Who's not gonna receive your help to do that? This is a thing come to help with their vision, not bring your own. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, we have six CSAs that we have across the state. Two of them are run by African-American mm -hmm. farmers, one by women only. And I tell everyone, when you wanna go to these areas, come, they already know what they wanna do. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to, once you build a relationship, infuse perhaps your ideas and creativity, but come and be humble. So I just wanted to, to share that and great question. Thanks, thanks Veronica. And I also popped in the chat box, the link to your Faith in Places page on sustainable food programs. Yeah. And don't you have a guide there, a written guide that people can download for free? Yes. And yeah, I thought you did. So everybody go there and download Veronica's guide. It's really awesome. Um, I have a question here for Josh from Ellen. Um, how would we convince industrial farmers to change their ways? Wouldn't it be difficult or more difficult as trying to get the fossil fuel industry to transition to green technology? Well, uh, first, I just want to thank Veronica for all of the references, which I was typing so fast. Hopefully, I got them all while you were speaking. The books are amazing. Uh, and I wanted to thank Roshana for that beautiful video. It was so inspiring. And, and, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, we often think big scale industrial agriculture, we need big scale solutions. And yes, there are big scale solutions. We absolutely should put pressure on banks. Wherever you bank, that bank is vested. It gives agricultural loans. Is it giving financial transition assistance? Is it giving money to urban gardening programs? Is it, is it facilitating 
um, industrial agriculture to move toward regeneration. All of those things are banks' responsibility. Absolutely, we have to put money on big food corporations um, because they're they're the middlemen that have kind of pushed and used as one of their tools systemic racism to essentially segregate us into food classes and to move food out of the hands of people, everyday people, which is just insane. Um, but I think you know to what you said, Veronica, and what you showed. Roshana, is there's a bigger power that we're not mm -hmm. accessing as a people when it comes to these issues. As much as 20% of urban land is uh, derelict or unused. Mm -hmm. We have a trillion dollar farm bill uh, that puts a tremendous amount of money into nutrition programs, but puts almost zero dollars into community education, community gardens, community farms. So we have a disconnect. And as Veronica pointed out, that disconnect has been unfortunately nurtured over time. Uh, to reconnect that disconnect is to say, okay, yeah, you know, maybe industrial farming is going to continue for a while. But while that happens, why don't we use the land that we have? Why don't yeah. we create clergy and city collaboration mm -hmm. to incentivize more urban gardening. Mm -hmm. uh, during uh, the Second World War, the United States had victory gardens. We grew almost 70% of our own fruits and vegetables, and many people had chickens in their own yards. The government passed out pamphlets to everyone, everyone. It wasn't discriminatory. They literally had everyone growing food in their, they plowed up baseball fields, they plowed out parking lots to grow food, and that was the food war effort. So we have had these times in American history where we have had a connection to our food. That connection has been severed. And I think rather than going, well, it's the industrial farmers that are doing this and they have to figure it out. It's like, let's figure it out together. This is, you know, this is an opportunity. Every seed can create food. So let's reclaim our urban land. Let's integrate where we've been disintegrated and let's come together and, and make food for many people. Sierra, do we have time for one more? I know we're cutting it close. We have so many questions and we'd love to. Oh, so many questions. <laughs> one small technical question. Um, Josh, is there a Spanish language version of this? We've gotten several requests for that here. They want yes. to share it, it there. It, it is, it is uh, Spanish language on the DVD and I believe uh, we'll double check the link you have as well. There should be a little pull down menu there on the side, on the right side with languages. Excellent. Thank you so much. I should have known that ahead of time. Um, and oh boy, so many other questions. Uh, here's a really basic one. What's the difference between organic products and products grown through regenerative agriculture? If there is a difference, how can we go to a market and buy products grown under regenerative agriculture? Since that's uh, the goal as consumers to be responsible, how do we do that? Yeah, I, I, who knows, we may have to do this again to get all these questions. I don't know how we're gonna, I, I see them, they're just, it's a scroll, it's amazing. Um, so Certified Organic is a program that was started under the USDA. Uh, we're 5 million acres now in the US of certified organic produce. The certification involves the minimal use of chemicals and the chemicals have to be biologically based. So we're taking out the bad stuff, the glyphosate, the, all of the atrazine, all of those terrible chemicals that build up in our foods. Um, so certified organic is kind of like a baseline of safety if you're going to shop in a supermarket. How do you shop regeneratively? This is going to be more and more of a question as time goes on. The number one thing we can do in our communities is to get to know farmers and gardeners or to create our own, you know, CSAs like Veronica and Roshana was showing us, um, any farmer that's growing in your region, that's an accomplishment, first of all. And even if they're still using chemicals, I would, I would much prefer to, to eat food from a, a local gardener who I can, a farmer or rancher that I could go and I can see their face and I, you know, than somebody who's shipping me something from across the country. And I think the movement toward regeneration happens inside of our conversations. It happens inside of the conversation that Veronica and Roshana were talking about, which is like, hey, 
do you need any help? I can volunteer. I can come on a Saturday. I'll bring my kids. Let's go. Let's do this thing. And, you know, it's very hard for a farmer to respect you if you say, hey, you shouldn't use chemicals. It's like, well, when was the last time you farmed? <laughs> I mean, it is the involvement of the community in the commons, and the commons should be a way we create food that is going to elevate this conversation. And, and, and that's where we say, hey, uh, let's not use this chemical here. Let's use uh, some bugs instead that, that eat these other bugs, or let's not use a chemical. Let's, let's do some cover crops. So I, I'm talking small scale, but small scale is powerful. I'm so glad you brought this, Josh. I just want to uh, add to this question. As we've been working with our CSAs and particularly those of color, to be certified organic is expensive. It takes money, five to $10,000 in many states. Many farmers don't have that kind of money, right? So many of them are using regenerative practices and making sure that they grow healthy, whole, non-chemical food because even with the USDA, you know, given this certification, it also has financial implications for a lot of food growers. And these are, I'm talking about our CSAs, our, our farms, they just can't afford to invest in, in that certification. So they've made the decision, like Josh said, to just grow healthy, natural, non-chemically influenced food. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. I know I could go another hour and, and have more conversation. I see people calling for another webinar to follow up on this one. And we had so many questions we didn't get to. Uh, hopefully we will be able to get some answers out to folks. But um, in the meantime, I want to I want to thank you, Josh. I want to thank you, Veronica. And I want to thank you, Roshana, for being with us today for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and um, your ideas and inspiration for all of us. It's just been um, just an amazing hour together. Um, I also wanna thank Sarah Paulos and our program team for putting together our Faith Climate Action Week resources for this year. We've been very excited to partner uh, and have access to the film Kiss the Ground. And um, I know this is just an incredible topic uh, for congregations, for people of, of faith and spirituality um, to have this important conversation about, about food and our food practices and food justice. And also uh, thank you to Ashiki Scott, our uh, programs assistant for running our tech for us today. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of you for being here today, for being a part of Faith Climate Action Week um, and for the inspiration to, to keep going and keep partnering um, with you, your congregations and your communities. Um, do let us know if you have additional questions. I know Sarah has dropped some links into the chat box for you as well. And I just want to say finally, blessings on the journey. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. It's